and all of a sudden you're hanging out with an NFL player, man, that is something that you probably never thought you were going to do back in small town USA. He likes her. She's a great girl, wholesome. He sees us. She's a quality woman. The next step was marriage, having the baby that they both wanted. What could be better than that? But an unthinkable crime would expose the truth behind this celebrity romance. I heard a woman screaming and then a pop pop. This was absolute overkill. This is personal. It was a high profile case that would lead detectives on a two year hunt to catch a killer driven by jealousy and revenge. This was an over the top infatuation. You're thinking, oh boy, this is going to get really salacious. And it obviously did. October 4th, 2007. Around 8 a.m., as most Chicago residents are getting ready for work, a frightened woman calls 911. Deerfield Police, I am so nervous right now. About 10 to 8, I heard a woman screaming and then a pop pop, and it went totally silent. Did you hear it out in the parking lot, or was it from a unit? No, it had to be from a unit. I called my neighbor upstairs, and she does not answer. Officers are quickly dispatched to the address, a condominium complex in Deerfield, Illinois. Deerfield is a town on Chicago's North Shore. It's an affluent suburb. Very, very peaceful, very quiet. This is where kids and moms and dads can walk the street at any time of day. This isn't where you find crime in Chicago. When police arrive, they discover evidence of a fatal shooting. She was in the uh, kitchen area of her condominium that she was running. At that point, you know, it was obvious to the first responding officers that there were gunshots involved. It was shocking because it's Deerfield, but even more shocking was that she was carrying her unborn child and the baby was killed also. It appeared for all intents and purposes that there was a belly shot. But who would do such a thing and why? In a case like this, the first rule of thumb is to do the basic police work, which is knocking on doors and talking to people and asking them just basic questions you just see or hear anything. Investigators learn the victim's name is Ronnie Ryder. She was seven months pregnant, and the father was well-known in Chicago. She was the girlfriend of Chicago Bears legend, Sean Gale. Ronnie Ryder grew up in Potosi, Wisconsin. And like many small towns across the country, it's a place where people take their football very seriously. She's just a wholesome, pure middle American girl. There's not a lot going on in Potosi. I mean, the closest big cities are Minneapolis and Chicago. But things picked up every summer when the Chicago Bears arrived for their football camp. Even in the sea of fans watching the team practice, a young woman as beautiful as Ronnie stood out. According to everyone who knew her, she was just a beautiful person, inside and out. There were plenty of men attracted to her, but she wasn't willing to just settle down with just anyone. Then in the summer of 1990, 24-year-old Ronnie caught the eye of one of the team's best players, 28-year-old defensive back Sean Gale. He likes her, she's a great girl. She's she's wholesome. She's not some, you know, just fly by night. He knows that he's a smart guy. He sees this. She's a quality woman. The feeling was mutual. Sean Gale was a successful football player. He was good looking. He was articulate. He's well spoken. An intelligent guy. Financially successful. Sean was not only handsome. He was also a star. A key member of the legendary Chicago Bears team that won the Super Bowl in 1986. The members of that team, the coaches, people would stop them everywhere to ask for autographs. Everything they did was followed, and Sean Gale was a big part of that team. It seems like he dated a lot of women in and around Chicago, and I can, I can see why. He wasn't married, he didn't have kids. He lived the life, and I can see why that would make people attracted to him. He's a free spirit. After a few years, 
Ronnie moved to Chicago to be closer to Sean and found work at a large fashion retailer. Over the next several years, their relationship continued to grow, but Ronnie never pressured Sean to settle down. Sean and Ronnie dated for almost two decades. The strange thing was, though, they never lived together and they never got married. At the end of the day, they seemed to really care about each other, but it also seemed to give him a little leeway as to what he wanted to do as far as dating and seeing other women. It seemed to work for him, and, and I guess if people, two people are happy at the end of the day, why judge? But in 2007, 18 years after they first met, that all changed when 41-year-old Ronnie revealed she had some unexpected news. She was very trim, very fit all the time, you know? I said, what's, uh, what's going on? How's, how's the nutrition going and everything? She just told me that she was pregnant. Sean had even told his mother about the pregnancy, and both his and Ronnie's families were thrilled. He said he was looking forward to having a baby with her and picked out a name together. The next step, probably, I would imagine, was marriage, having the baby that they both wanted, settling down, and just living in a town that loves you. What could be better than that? However, any dreams the couple had for the future now lie in ruins. The scene is absolutely horrible. I mean, she's lying there on the kitchen floor, and her hands are around her stomach while she was trying to protect the baby. There's even an ultrasound on the refrigerator. I mean, it's just absolutely heartbreaking. Coming up, detectives learn more about the murder weapon. They think that the killer used a silencer. And if so, this wasn't a crime of passion. This was an execution. Chicago police have just discovered 42-year-old expectant mother Ronnie Ryder lying dead in her Deerfield condominium. And they're already feeling the pressure to solve what promises to be a very high-profile murder. As it happened, one of the doors, apparently, that we had knocked on was an individual that worked for a Chicagoland newspaper. So I think within several minutes, there were news helicopters all over. We hear Sean Gale's name involved in this whole thing. Oh, man, it became a big story. Inside Ronnie's home, Investigators are collecting evidence to try and determine what happened. There were any signs of forced entry or theft, so the investigators realized that either she opened the door for the killer or the killer had a key. The location of the bullet wounds suggests that whoever shot Ronnie wanted to make sure they killed both the mother and child. There was a belly shot as well as, you know, a number of other shots. The killer fired over seven rounds. I mean, this was absolute overkill. So it became relatively apparent that this is personal. There is no physical evidence. There is no DNA. There are no fingerprints. And the evidence they are able to recover only raises more questions. There were sponge shell casings, which are consistent with a semi-automatic weapon being discharged. But then there were also bullets that had not been fired. So that was one of those things that we had to figure out. Was it a malfunctioning weapon? So that in itself was strange. Police determined that the shell casings belonged to a 9mm handgun, which would have been much louder than the popping sound the 911 caller described. The type of noise she heard, they weren't outright gunshots, but she described something that was similar to it in a muffled sense. They think that it was possible that the killer used a silencer. And if so, this wasn't a crime of passion. This was an execution. Detectives canvassed the building, hoping to find an eyewitness. While no one saw the shooting, one of Ronnie's neighbors says they caught a glimpse of someone fleeing after the gunfire. A person running on foot right around the same time that this would have occurred dressed all in black. They described an uh, Afro-like haircut, and it was, a, they said, a dark-skinned male. The neighbor tells police the man drove away in a black sedan, and there is one man in Ronnie's life who fits the description. People didn't want to believe that Sean had anything to do with it. He was a member of the 86 Bears, and everybody loved him. Maybe you don't want to be tied down. 
Maybe you don't want to be responsible for a kid. Did she do this to entrap you? Did she do this to keep you around? Is this the way she was going to get you to finally give her the ring? Without a doubt. I've got to look at him. I think he'd be crazy not to. Detective suspicions only deepen when police find evidence that Ronnie and Sean's relationship was under a lot of stress. They find Ronnie's purse, and inside was a letter accusing Sean of being a womanizer. There was a list of females that apparently had some kind of a relationship with Sean Gale. And I don't know the exact verbiage in the letter, but generally it was like, do you know that he's having relationships with these women? The letter she received indicates that Sean was having affairs with as many as 18 different women. Is it possible Ronnie confronted Sean, causing him to snap? Everything pointed to Sean Gale, and I think since we were post-OJ, everybody's like, okay, well, here you go. We have another NFL player who's just kind of lost his mind. He's gone off the rails. But before police can bring Sean in for questioning, he calls them. This is Commander Phil Huss. Can I help you? Um, listen, I've been getting calls from the, the, the media. This is Sean Gale, and they're naming me as a suspect. Can I have you talk to an investigator? Yes, please. Okay, come to the Deerfield Police Department. Do you know where it is? <laughs> When investigators meet with Sean, he seems genuinely upset about the news of Ronnie's death. Sean was cooperative. We had interviewed him for, for several hours and tried to establish a timeline as to where he was, where he was coming from, trying to either you know, eliminate him as a suspect or still keep him on the list. Police confront Sean with the incriminating letter, but he assures them it wasn't a problem. Ronnie knew what she was getting into, and she made her peace. Her not making a big deal about him dating other women was probably why he stayed with her for so long. Not only does Sean appear to have no motive, he's also able to produce an airtight alibi. Sean was at a barber shop in North Chicago. There's a barber there that apparently is a legacy amongst the Chicago Bears. A lot of them go there to, even to this day to get their hair cut. Sean was there getting a haircut with another Chicago Bear. Sean Gale was quickly ruled out as a suspect, and publicly. There was no hedging. They were like, no, he's not a suspect. While Sean has been cleared, he does give police a new lead. Ronnie might not have been jealous of Sean's other lovers. But one of them was. Sean told the police that he thought the killer might be the same person sent in the letters, a Polish fitness instructor named Monica. Monica Karowska was a, a woman who had dated Sean a year or two earlier, and it sounded like an unpleasant breakup. Sean said that Monica had been bothering him at his apartment to the point of harassment. Sean tells police it was soon after that incident that the other women he was dating began to receive the same letter. Sean felt that because of the broken English, it had to have been Monica. That coupled with her behavior made Sean afraid that he wasn't sure how far she would go. It was dangerous to the point where Sean had an order of protection issued against Monica. Was Monica obsessed enough to kill Ronnie and her unborn child? Hoping for another chance with Sean? Coming up, investigators question one jealous ex, only to find another. This was an over-the-top infatuation. She was jealous of Ronnie because she was obsessed with Sean Gale. Investigators in Deerfield, Illinois, have determined that Chicago sports hero Sean Gale wasn't the one who murdered his longtime girlfriend, Ronnie Ryder. Sean had broken things off with a woman named Monica who had begun stalking him. And he told police that she started sending letters to a lot of the women in his life, including the letter found in Ronnie's purse. Although Monica doesn't match the description given by Ronnie's neighbor, detectives know that doesn't mean she wasn't involved. They had a vague eyewitness description by someone who said they saw somebody running through the parking lot about the time of the shooting. The neighbors said they saw a dark-skinned man, so clearly it wasn't Monica, but they couldn't get a good look, so it could have been anyone. 
When police bring Monica in for questioning, she denies writing the letters. Monica at the time was a private fitness instructor and she was conducting a private class and she had a rock solid alibi. The police confirmed that she was not a suspect within a couple days. With no further leads, detectives turned to the letter found in Ronnie's purse, hoping it might shed some light on potential suspects. The letter had a hard copy of all the emails that Sean had been sending to the other women. And whoever sent the letter somehow had the information, the phone numbers and the addresses for the other women. The one connection is where would somebody be able to obtain all these names and addresses? And really, the, the one place would be Sean's computer. When detectives ask Sean if any of the other women in his life had access to his files, he says yes. 40-year-old fitness model and real estate agent, Marnie Yang. Marnie was not just someone he had been spending time with. She was also his business partner. So she was in his office regularly. She had been married and been divorced for a while. She had three kids with her former husband when she met Sean Gale. According to Sean, his relationship with Marnie was mostly business. But the two did hook up occasionally. In fact, they'd gotten together the night before Ronnie was killed. Sean might have had a cold or a sick or something to that effect. And she had brought him some chicken soup. And, you know, they had consensual sex. Could Marnie have been the one sending the letters? The police show Sean a list of phone numbers and ask him if he could recognize them, and he could recognize pretty much all of them. It seems Marnie had been calling everyone that Sean called. She wasn't just meddling around in his relationships. She was causing chaos in other areas of his life. For instance, she was canceling hotel and flight arrangements soon after he set them up. We talk about stalkers, and, and I believe there was actually a film made about that where somebody had gotten into a relationship with somebody, and the next thing you know, you've got a rabbit boiling in a pot. A background check reveals this wouldn't be the first time Marnie acted strangely with the men in her life. In fact, one had even taken out a restraining order. Marnie Yang was working with a program supposedly to support the police department. I believe that was also a front to meet and be around police officers she was sleeping with. One of those officers, when he tried to break off the affair, she became what he described as very vindictive. He related that he was scared and actually had an early retirement from the police department and relocated his entire family because of that. So the red flags went up that if a veteran Chicago police officer is scared of this individual, that's very telling. Had Sean Gale become the latest object of Marnie's dangerous obsessions? Marnie, she liked to brag that she was Sean Gale's girlfriend, but it was just wild sex. At this point, Investigators know it's not enough to make an arrest. And with the entire city of Chicago watching, police want to build the strongest case possible. There's virtually no physical evidence at Ronnie's condominium where she was killed, aside from the shell casings from the bullets. In a high-profile homicide like this, we weren't going to do anything until we had what we thought was absolutely 100% everything that we needed to make a rock-solid case. Coming up, faced with the need to produce evidence, investigators get creative. One of the tactics investigators use is, they call them garbage pulls, grabbing the garbage bags and going through anything and everything of value. And detectives will finally get a chance to hear what Marnie has to say. Was there ever any conflict between you and Ronnie? suspects have already been cleared in the murder of 42-year-old Ronnie Ryder. Now, detectives are looking into a third, another one of Sean Gale's many love interests, 40-year-old realtor Marnie Yang. It appeared that she had been stalking 
Sean and interfering in his life. And according to the police, this is something she had a history of doing with her past boyfriends. So far, detectives don't have any solid evidence linking Marnie to the crime. But Sean offers to help them find some. While Sean has been involved with many other women, it's clear Ronnie Ryder and their unborn child were special to him. If you talk to, to Ronnie's family, they say that she was very much, very much a family person, that she wanted that commitment. And I think by looking back and what we've learned about uh, Sean Gale and Ronnie post all of this, I think that's what Sean wanted too. Sean tells police he is willing to do anything he can to help them catch the killer. He was very helpful to the point where Sean wore a wire for us. He agrees to secretly record a conversation with Marnie, hoping he might get her to confess. Could have been paranoid, or it could have been she was very, you know, sensitive to the questions and exchanges that maybe Sean was acting a little bit out of character. He wasn't able to get her to say anything remotely incriminating in the recording. Detectives will have to find another way to connect her to the murder. One of the tactics that investigators use is they call them garbage pulls, where you're looking for any type of evidence and the garbage is located in a public area so we do have access without warrant to look at it. The move eventually pays off. They found evidence that she had ordered, I believe it was two books, uh, on how to make basically a do-it-yourself silencer for a handgun. We found receipts. Uh, from a Home Depot, it actually turned out that a lot of the components that were in these homemade silencer books were purchased by Marnie. A homemade silencer not only explains the muffled popping sounds witnesses heard, it also solves one of the lingering questions about the crime. Officers found bullets that had not been fired in addition to the spent shell casings. And it didn't make sense at the time, but an amateur making a silencer would cause a gun to malfunction like this. Those were very fruitful uh, garbage pulls. Armed with this information, police bring Marnie in for questioning. Was there ever any conflict between you and Ron? I never met her. I never met her, I never spoke to her, I never... He was pretty good about keeping everything separate. And Marnie said she was fully aware of the situation with Ronnie. You know, there's a small matter of a baby. You know, um, you know, uh, my baby. And I'm like, really? Okay. I'm like, uh, are we happy about this? You know, and I said, just like that. He's like, um, uh, no. He's like, no. Just as with their previous suspects, Marnie appears to have an ironclad alibi. I had come home to check on the kids real quick. Um, I let them know that I was going to be going out to Christie's. And then I went back to the garage to leave, and the car wouldn't start. So I ended up not going out there. Marnie was very clever. At a point, you almost thought that Marnie was interviewing the detectives to find out exactly how much information they had. But when police pushed her for details about the mysterious letters, Marnie shut down. You know, you said that if there was a question that I didn't feel up to answering, that I could... Okay, that's fine. You know, I'm when investigators try to verify Marnie's whereabouts, her children aren't sure whether she was home or not. Fortunately, investigators come up with another way to prove Marnie is lying about where she was the morning of the murder. A lot of investigations are very chronological, very thorough, involve evidence, forensics, interviews, but a lot of it is luck. And in this case, we had an investigator on the task force who happened to go to a rent -a car class that they threw to provide law enforcement with the ability to run names and variables in their database. 
they found that she had rented a Volkswagen the day before Brownie was killed. In a lot of cases, murder cases, drug cases, the primary method of transportation is a rent a car. It's the perfect car because you rent it, you bring it back, and what's the first thing that they do? They clean it. By the time you discover that even that car was utilized, that car could be in a different state, could have been sold, could have changed hands a hundred times. The rental car fits the description of the black sedan seen leaving Ronnie's building. It had been returned only a few hours after the shooting. But that's not all detectives find. The police trace the contact number listed on the rental car receipt to a disposable phone purchased by Marnie Yang from a big box retailer a week earlier. That phone had made at least one phone call near Deerfield the day of the murder. All of this information, the rental car, the burner phone, was really compelling. But it was circumstantial, and prosecutors want an airtight case. They want a confession. Coming up, to catch their killer, police enlist the aid of her closest friend. The mistake that most murderers make is either involving another individual or telling somebody about what they did. Homicide detectives and state prosecutors are building a case against 40-year-old Marnie Yang for the murder of Ronnie Ryder and her unborn child. It took the police almost a year to put all these pieces together to implicate Marnie, but they needed more. They wanted that one final bit to make sure the charges stuck. While reviewing the documents Marnie filled out to rent a car the day Ronnie was killed, detectives come across something odd. She used an address out in the suburbs, even though Marnie lived in the city in Chicago. The address belongs to a woman named Christy Passion. We knew that Christy was a very close friend of Marnie's, somebody that Marnie trusted. There was probably some knowledge on Christy's part regarding what had happened to Ronnie Reuter. We have a saying in homicide investigations, we don't believe in coincidences. Christy was brought in um, and she was interviewed. It didn't take too long to lay out the facts to her. And at that point, she admittedly said, yes, this is what happened. She becomes a critical piece of the investigation. According to Christy, Marnie was extremely jealous of Ronnie's relationship with Sean and saw her pregnancy as a threat. And Marnie had confessed everything to her in great detail. This was a very planned and executed murder. Marnie thought of almost everything. The silencer and an escape plan. The dark-skinned male seen fleeing the scene was actually Marnie in disguise. Trying to describe a person who's in disguise running away, you're not going to get a really good description. Is it a male? Is it a female? She cleverly put her personal cell phone in a drawer next to her bed, and she bought what we call a burner phone, and she called her own phone from that burner phone at a certain time, which would indicate off of phone records that she was at home during these certain periods of time. After the shooting, Christy said that Marnie put the murder weapon in a bucket of cement and left it in a dumpster somewhere in Chicago. It's been quite some time since she would have disposed of the gun. And so the chances of finding it in Chicago, in a landfill somewhere, with layers and layers of garbage, was next to none. So far, Christy hasn't told police anything they can prove. But she agrees to help them catch Marnie. Police persuade her to wear a recording device and meet with Marnie so they can get electronic eavesdropping on their conversation. Of course, she's worried about being a conspirator in the case, so she agrees to it. And of course, you've got to be careful because Marnie is a very clever individual. Wearing a hidden recording device, Christy meets Marnie for tea and ice cream at a local diner. You can hear the noise of the restaurant all around them. It was a conversation, dishes being moved and clanked, and it's noisy, and they're whispering. So you have to listen very closely. Mr. Harris, who had come to my house, threw down two papers on my table. 
and looked at me and went, just that you know, this isn't all we have. Okay. I told them I didn't know anything. If they had anything substantial, they wouldn't have been coming to you. They would have been coming to get me. Okay. She wasn't being pressed a lot by Christy, and there were some general questions that were answered. We brought that back to the state's attorney, and the state's attorney said, we'd like to get more detail. Do you think we could do this again? This time, Christy gets Marnie to talk about the murder. And once she starts, she doesn't stop. The conversation is chilling. Marnie starts telling Christy, in matter-of-fact, methodical detail, how she carried out Ronnie Reuter's murder. She opened up the door, and all she saw was a dark-skinned person with sunglasses holding a gun like this. And she started screaming. And I just started emptying her. That second interview was was absolutely astonishing because not only did she go over what she did in great detail, she actually described the shooting, how she shot, she aimed for the stomach. I took maybe one or two steps into the kitchen to finish the job. I took one last shot and then finished her. She took a photograph of the embryonic scan and she also, which we didn't even realize, took a bracelet that Ronnie wore, a pregnancy bracelet. She'd come in here, she was pregnant, and she'd still work out. She wore that medical bracelet, and every time she walked in here, I noticed it was on. With Christie's help, police are able to recover the bracelet. Marnie described having Christie drive around and burying that bracelet in Rolling Meadows. Finding that bracelet was an extraordinary piece of evidence. On March 4th, 2009, police finally arrest Marnie Yang. Detectives arrived at her home early in the morning and waited for her to go to her vehicle. As soon as she went to her car, several detectives took her into custody. Because of the shots deliberately aimed at Ronnie's pregnant belly, Marnie is charged with two counts of first-degree murder. When police execute a search warrant of her home, they find even more evidence of Marnie's jealousy and obsession. At some point when she was at Sean's house and he left the room, Sean's computer was not passworded out, so she downloaded the data onto a thumb drive. It's proof that Marnie had been sending out all these letters to the women that Sean had been romantically involved with, including herself. When news of Marnie Yang's arrest and the details of her crimes are made public, the city of Chicago is stunned. The whole thing was very surreal. Just surreal. It just wasn't anything she would get involved with. It wasn't anything she'd want to be around. You start hearing, okay, beautiful girl that was tragically murdered, NFL star, and now Marnie Yang is in custody, and you're thinking, oh boy, this is going to get really salacious. And it obviously did. Now it's up to state prosecutors to make sure the killer is brought to justice. Coming up, before the trial even begins, Marnie's defense makes an unexpected move. It could have major consequences for the prosecution. Their case rises or falls on the Christie Passion tape. Investigators have spent nearly two years building a case against Marnie Yang for the murder of 42-year-old Ronnie Ryder. Police believe Marnie murdered her pregnant rival in a jealous rage. And taped conversations with her closest friend prove it. When she went up the movie, that's when I brought the gun. And I just wanted to just We had over 200 pieces of circumstantial evidence. This was probably one of the uh, most rock-solid cases uh, that I've ever been involved in. But before the trial begins, the defense motions to have the tapes thrown out on a technicality. 
This is why you hire a defense attorney. It's a minor, petty, jurisdictional argument. But if successful, it could have major consequences for the prosecution. There is no physical evidence. There are no eyewitnesses. Their case rises or falls on the Christie Passion tape. Unfortunately for Marnie, the judge doesn't rule in her favor. The tapes will be allowed as evidence. On March 1st, 2011, the trial begins. Prosecutors portray Marnie Yang as a woman driven by obsession, willing to do anything to keep Sean Gale for herself. The two tape conversations with Christy in the restaurant were, were just convincing. You heard those and you realized that Marnie was in serious trouble because it was, it was extremely detailed. Christy Passion had taken the stand and she indicated that Marty had confessed to her that she wanted to kill Ronnie because she was jealous. Ronnie was having Sean's child and that made her special in a way that none of the other women were. The defense argues that police singled out Marnie from the beginning with no evidence to back up their assumptions ignoring the 18 or 19 other women Sean was sleeping with. If much of that case is fabricated or colored to convict, and it's never tested, you'll end up with a result of a false conviction. The prosecutors and the police need to be told not to do that. But prosecutors insist that of all the women Sean had been involved with, only Marnie was jealous enough to commit such an unthinkable crime. We interviewed every female that we had obtained information about that had an ongoing relationship or even a past relationship with Sean. We interviewed every single one of them. Marnie's defense attorney at one point said when Marnie and Christy got together to talk, it was a festival of liars. And, and he said flat out that you couldn't believe much of what either of them said. It was just two women talking in a restaurant, telling wild stories. The question is, would the jury see it that way? I couldn't see any way that this was going to be anything but a, a guilty finding. On April 15th, after only four hours of deliberation, the jury returns its verdict. They find Marnie guilty on both counts of first-degree murder. She convicted herself by her own admission, her bragging to her friend who was wearing a wire and gave instances and facts that only the killer would know. There's no doubt in my mind that the jury got the verdict right. Three and a half years after Ronnie's murder, Marnie is sentenced to the maximum penalty allowed, life in prison without the possibility of parole. For Ronnie's family, it is a cold comfort. There was a sense of relief, but there was also, a, a, you could feel the anger that why was this necessary? You know, why did we lose not only a daughter, but people tend to forget a grandchild. You're just cold-blooded and wiped out two human beings, you know, for no other reason than jealousy. As far as I'm concerned, she should have been executed. I think it has to affect a guy like Sean Gale immensely. How do you get over somebody you love being murdered at the hands of somebody you were involved with? There's a woman who's dead. There's a baby that's unborn. At the end of the day, I just think it's really sad. just sort of sprung it on her and she said yes. Both of them seemed to have a slightly impulsive streak. But their seemingly blissful union wasn't all it appeared to be. There had been a history of disputes involving the couple. She had blood in her eardrum. She had marks all over her face. The relationship would ultimately come to a violent and bloody end. 
But was it a desperate act of self-defense or calculated revenge? She just hit her breaking point. 911, what's your emergency? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, what happened? Just after noon on March 21st, 2010, when police in Hardin County, Tennessee, receive an unusual 911 call. 911, what's your emergency? I just shot and killed my husband. Is he grieving? I don't know. I shot him several times. Okay, hold on just a minute. Let me get a name. Okay. What's your name? Shannon Bogus. Shannon, what's your husband's name? George Edward Bogus. Okay. Officers and EMTs are immediately dispatched to the address. It's unclear whether the victim was dead or alive, and unfortunately, it did take a long time for authorities to get there. The Bogus family lived on Lonesome Pine Road, which is just about the most rural part of Hardin County. So the Hardin County Sheriff's Department is the only agency that would respond to that, and they would be at least 15 minutes away. In the meantime, police are just trying to get an idea of exactly what it is they're walking into here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, what happened? I was have tired a... of being beat. Okay, did you shoot him with a pistol or a shotgun or a rifle or what? I shot him with a pistol. Okay, you don't have it in your hand now? Or... Yes, I do. Okay, you need to put that down because the police are on the way out there. Officers arrive to find Shannon Bogus calmly waiting for them to arrest her. Officers handcuffed her there at the scene and then began to clear the residence. Inside the house, uh, police officers found three teenagers. It was his son, her two children. They quickly escorted them out of the house. It's a very small house. As I went in to the very back left was their bedroom. So I came in, I saw Mr. Bogus lying on the bed. From the amount of blood, it's clear that they are far too late to save him. He had visible signs of death, a lot of trauma from the gunshots. This was a very violent domestic incident that ended uh, in death. There had been a history of disputes involving the couple, and the sheriff, Sammy Davidson, was, was aware of this. But is this a straightforward case of self-defense, or is there more to the story? Shannon was an Arkansas native who'd moved to Tennessee when she was 18 years old. Shannon's maiden name was Roach, and they moved to Savannah, Tennessee, when her dad purchased a car dealership there. I can imagine, as a teenager, it would be very difficult um, for her to fit in, to feel like she belonged, to feel like she was a part of the community. She wanted to fit in, and she ended up marrying a local boy. In 1990, 20-year-old Shannon married Craig Tyler, and over the next 13 years, they built a life together. She was caring for a newborn son um, and pregnant with her daughter when she was in nursing school, graduated with honors. I can't, I mean, that's, that's tough. She graduated, she worked at the local hospital during the night, uh, taking a night shift there. Her husband, Craig, worked during the day. Eventually, their busy schedules put a strain on the relationship. In 2003, the couple divorced. After her divorce, Shannon kept on working as a nurse, um, caring for her two kids, and um, she was able to, to earn a, a fairly decent living as a nurse. Between the hospital and single motherhood, Shannon didn't have much time for love until she crossed paths with Eddie Bogus in 2004. If I remember correctly, he met Shannon on a horse ride. He was in a club that rode a lot, and I think they hit it off. There's trails all through Hardeman County, and there's lots of trail rides that go on, so lots of people have horses. It wasn't long before Shannon and Eddie were riding together without the group. It was during a horseback ride that 
Eddie and Shannon were taken together. Eddie gave her a kiss. It really swept her off her feet, and, and she fell in love with him. Eddie proposed to Shannon, but he had to finalize his divorce first. After spending just over a year together, in February of 2006, Eddie surprised Shannon with a trip to the courthouse. Eddie goes to finalize his divorce, and once he finalizes that, he turns and says, we're getting married next door. Eddie said he wanted to get married quickly before he messed things up. Um, Shannon was initially a little bit taken aback at, the, at him wanting to get married so quickly, but she had fallen in love with him, agreed to it, and they got married. Both of them seem to have a slightly impulsive streak, so I don't think it would be that unusual in their circumstances to go ahead and just say, hey, let's just do it. Shannon, with her 11-year-old son and 10-year-old daughter, moved into the rustic cabin Eddie shared with his 14-year-old teenage son. The home was surrounded by nature. It was sort of back in a, a road against a hill. And for someone who loves rural areas, peace and quiet was a very, very peaceful, quiet area and was the perfect place for Shannon and Eddie. Shannon continued to work as a nurse while Eddie worked odd jobs and trained horses. He sold and raised dogs for a little bit of money. He did have a little bit of land, but she was the ultimate breadwinner. On their first Christmas together, Eddie gave Shannon a new saddle for her horse, and he always knew how to make her smile. But the honeymoon wouldn't last forever. Now, just four years into their marriage, Eddie is lying dead in their bedroom after Shannon shot him multiple times. We thought they was great together. You know, they was laughing, having fun all the time. And then, all of a sudden, you know, they started hearing other things, and then... Before you know it, he was dead. Coming up, investigators uncover the dark truth behind an abusive relationship. He came across as a nice guy, but there was this other side to him. In Hardin County, Tennessee, police are investigating the shooting death of Eddie Bogus. His wife, Shannon, has already confessed to shooting him in self-defense. It's up to detectives to find out if she's telling the truth. Terry Dykus was the agent that was assigned to the case. Uh, Terry grew up there, worked in that area, and uh, he went in and looked at it. Hours after the fatal shooting, Dykus is trying to get the witnesses' versions of events leading up to his death. On that day, um, Eddie was there, Shannon was there. And there had been an argument over what people were watching on television. There was a fight over the remote control, and apparently Eddie had a show he wanted to watch, the kids wanted to watch his show, and then I guess Shannon didn't back him up. Eddie got very upset with her, and Eddie wanted her to go into the bedroom. And she went into the bedroom, and at that point, he started striking her with the riding crop. He wouldn't stop. He was so enraged that she feared for her life. At that point, she grabbed a hold of a gun that was sitting on the nightstand and started shooting him. Both the evidence and witnesses seemed to support Shannon's claims. The other people that were there said that they could tell she was being beaten with something. And when I talked to Miss Bogus, I looked for injuries, and she had injuries consistent with um, the riding crop that was found there in the bedroom. The gunshot wounds to Eddie were in the front of his body, which is hugely important if you're looking at this case, because in any murder investigation, homicide investigation, you look at where the victim is, you look at where the person is that's doing the shooting. Knowing that the shots were in the front, it meant he was facing her, and he could have very likely been coming at her, been, you know, making threatening motions toward her. The way the room was set up, if Mr. Bogus had been in the doorway, she would have had no way to escape through him to get out except through the gun. He would have been able to do whatever he wanted to do to her. However, there is one detail that gives investigators pause. Shannon grabbed the pistol and basically emptied it. I believe she shot him three times in the head, maybe three times in the abdomen as well. Just one or two shots would have certainly stopped him, but she made sure that he was dead. I decided, since the scene was secured, to go and speak to Miss Bogus and get her statement about what happened. 
Shannon insists that she didn't want to kill her husband, but he'd left her with little choice. Shannon said at first her relationship was great, but then he became violent, and oftentimes even pinning her down to the ground. Shannon says she remembers clearly the first time Eddie's anger turned to violence. Every day when Shannon was at work, Eddie would go to a coffee shop to visit his ex-wife and his daughter. And this is something that really bothered Shannon when she found out about it. She said he flew into a rage and grabbed her by the hair. He told her in no uncertain terms that he would do as he pleased. Shannon says Eddie apologized and she forgave him. It was the beginning of a cycle that would repeat over and over again. It escalated to biting, to kicking, to horse whips. I think each time it happened, it escalated a little bit more, and it started just getting more and more out of hand. After these events would happen, Eddie would always apologize. He would say this would never happen again. As time passed, the beatings increased, um, became more harsh, and Shannon even came to the place where she believed that she had brought this on herself. She thought maybe she could change the course of what happened to her. And I think for a lot of women who are in abusive relationships, they feel like they can change this person and that it's their job kind of as a savior to do so. Shannon's description of her marriage doesn't exactly come as a surprise. Local police are well acquainted with Eddie Bogus and his temper. Eddie grew up in rural Hardin County, uh, Cerro Gordo. He was not raised by his mother. He was raised by his grandparents in that area. Eddie had a difficult childhood. He wasn't taught good coping skills, and because of that, he always got into trouble. Eddie had a rough reputation, and he was known by the nickname of, of Bad Egg. His name came from some of the things that he had done, flashes of temper that people had seen. He had a hard time controlling himself. As an adult, little changed for Eddie Bad Egg Bogus. He continued to get himself into trouble and had the rap sheet to go with it. The information that I gained as I learned more about Eddie is that he had a history of violence toward women, not only Shannon, but a prior wife. He had a history of violence toward everyone. Mr. Bogus, uh, as I recall, had at least one conviction for possession with intent to resell marijuana or the sale of marijuana. What investigators want to know is, why would a hard-working nurse like Shannon choose to stay with a man like that? It's extremely complicated, extremely difficult. This was a, a case where you say, well, why didn't she just leave? She could have, you know, made money um, and support herself. But she obviously loved him. It, it's very clear in her comments that she made after she shot him. And so it becomes difficult in an abusive relationship, especially if you're blaming yourself for that relationship. It's not easy just to walk away. Self-defense was a plausible reason for the shooting. But remember, we're talking about a woman who suffered years of abuse. So there could have been another motive here as well, which would be revenge. Coming up, detectives find out this wasn't the first time Shannon held Eddie's life in her hands. Eddie was short of breath, he started sweating, he was having a heart attack. <laughs> 39-year-old Shannon Bogus claims that she shot her husband, Eddie, after years of abuse. But investigators are questioning if killing him was really her only option. This was something that just didn't really make much sense to investigators. We have a woman here who is college educated. She has a job. She has plenty of friends, plenty of places she could go if she needed to. So why would she stick around? As a reporter over many years, I've, I've seen many, many cases of uh, alleged abuse where the woman says, I'm not going to leave. I'm just going to stay. And, and it happens again and again. And there are some women who are abused say, you know, I thought I could love the abuse out of this man. And Shannon may have felt this about Eddie. Shannon admits that her feelings about Eddie were complicated. For a long time, she'd taken the good with the bad. He was an old soul, a great guy. I mean, he 
would give you the shirt off his back if you needed it. People talked about that Eddie was a nice guy. He, he could be very charming. He liked to read. Um, he was very interested in the Civil War. They really did love each other. She's a nurse, and that's a helping profession. There are women who have a savior complex, and they want to help. She may have felt, you know what? He's pulling at my heartstrings. He had a bad childhood, and I want to save this person. But while Shannon believed Eddie could change, she was concerned for the safety of their children. Shannon mentioned many times that one of the reasons she kept going back was because of the children. Eddie never laid a hand on Shannon's kids from a previous marriage, but he was very aggressive to his son. Normally, this would be a reason to leave, not a reason to stay. So they had to wonder if she had decided to get rid of him long before this fight in the bedroom. Despite investigators' suspicions, Shannon sticks by her story. She says that if she really wanted Eddie out of the picture, she had an opportunity over a year ago. In January 2009, Eddie flew into one of his rages and started beating Shannon. She thought she was in for the same thing again, but then he stopped. He was short of breath. He started sweating. He was complaining of stabbing pain in between his shoulder blades. Being a nurse, Shannon obviously recognized that he was having a heart attack. Instead of letting him die, Shannon gave Eddie an aspirin and rushed him to the hospital. Well, I mean, that was like before she killed him. You know, why'd she take care of him then? She could have just turned her back on him and let him go. But she stood right by his side, took great care of him. From his hospital bed, Eddie told Shannon that his heart attack was karma and that he really wanted to change. You know, he had had the heart attack while he was beating her, and so this was something that I guess was a little bit of a wake-up call for him. But as soon as he recovered, the beatings only got worse. The sheriff's department had received several reports of abuse, and they were worried that it was escalating. There were several different occasions where she had visible signs of domestic assault. There was one incident where Shannon's father called the police. The cops came to her house and said, we know what's going on, we're going to take him to jail. Local sheriff's deputies tried to get Shannon into a, a women's shelter, but she did not want to go. Ultimately, police convinced Shannon to leave the house, but it was only a temporary reprieve. Reluctantly, Shannon went along with police, and they started arranging to have her stay in a shelter for battered women. While they were working out the logistics of her transport, they provided Shannon with a hotel room for the night in Savannah, Tennessee. But by the next morning, she was gone. It turned out Shannon had received a call from Eddie's son, begging her to come back. He was crying. He told her he needed her. He told her he couldn't stand it at home without her. There was nothing that police could do. And, and this is, you know, it's true. Um, they really, really couldn't intervene. Shannon was not willing to press charges. She was not willing to leave. And so they were powerless if she wouldn't testify against him to prove it, that anything had happened. By 2010, four years into their marriage, the abuse had escalated out of control. And on the day of the shooting, Shannon says Eddie seemed to have finally snapped. He's hit her before, but not anything near to this extent. He was pounding her with his fists, and then after that, he decided to pick up a riding crop that was nearby and lay into her with that. I think she realized at some point Eddie was going to do her in. I think she really felt that that was the day that instead of just being beaten or hit, um, that he was going to kill her. She's crawling over the bed trying to get out of there, but she sees that there's no way out of this room, and she knows that the kids are used to hearing this stuff by now. She knows no one's coming to save her, so she grabs the 357 that's on the nightstand. She said the first shot didn't stop him. He kept coming after her, so she kept pulling the trigger until he stopped. Based on the evidence, detectives are inclined to believe her. She killed him based on her reasonable belief. That's what she has to do to stop the the physical abuse that she's undertaking that, that no woman should have to have to endure. Coming up, Shannon starts a new life without her abusive husband. 
But not everyone believes she's the victim she claims to be. They always say there's two sides to every story. Hardin County Police have been interrogating Shannon Bogus for several hours. Shannon claims that she shot her abusive husband, Eddie, to protect her own life and the lives of their children. Everything investigators have learned so far seems to match her story. After they were taken out of the home, the investigators questioned the children, and all the children confirmed Shannon's story. When Agent Dykus and the other investigators looked into the case, they did determine that, you know, abuse had taken place from Eddie. There was evidence that uh, Shannon had been beaten that day. She, she did have injuries. She was treated. There was the history. There was also a, a statement from the, the TBI agent that he didn't see there was any evidence of premeditation. Everything that I was seeing was consistent with self-defense. So at that time, I did not arrest her. Shannon is released with no charges brought against her. Whether she can move on from the traumatic incident is another question entirely. I advised her that it'd be a good idea if she got out of the area for a while to make sure there's no retribution from one of his friends or something of that nature. So she moved to Arkansas. Her parents checked her into a battered women's shelter while her kids went to stay with relatives. She was able to get the support that she needed there to come to terms with her abuse as well as killing her husband. She really loved Eddie. Uh, she really did. And she was very distraught over shooting him. The shelter also tried to help Shannon find an apartment and get her incorporated back into a normal everyday routine. A few days into her stay, Shannon briefly returns to Tennessee to gather her belongings. And much to everyone's surprise, she also attends Eddie's funeral. Eddie had told his friends and family that he wanted to be cremated. Eddie had wanted his ashes to be placed in a Crown Royal bottle. Um, his family did that, and then they distributed them during a horseback ride. In public, the community was very sympathetic of Shannon. They identified with her situation. Eddie's death was, of course, horrific, but she didn't have a choice. Most people in Hardin County seemed to believe that Eddie had it coming to him. There had been a history of abuse. This was not a one-time thing. But behind closed doors, Eddie's friends don't agree with the decision to let her go. No, I thought she would go to jail. Really? I didn't hear all the evidence, but the Eddie I knew wouldn't have done that. You know, nothing like she said. To Eddie's family and friends, his killing looked like a cold-blooded murder. They always say there's two sides to every story. His friends viewed it one way and hers viewed it the other. They aren't the only ones to take Eddie's side. We're the, the gatherers of the facts. The district attorney is the one that makes the decision whether the case moves forward, goes to a grand jury, or says there's no charges to be pending or brought against the person. In this case, the district attorney felt like that he wanted to go forward to the grand jury. They weren't going to be deciding Shannon's guilt or innocence. A grand jury is simply impaneled to decide whether or not they'll move forward with an indictment. And if so, then the case goes to trial. In July of 2010, four months after Eddie was shot, the grand jury is presented with the details of Shannon's case. They heard all of the evidence, as well as these extenuating circumstances of spousal abuse, but ultimately, they didn't agree with investigators. To them, this was not just a simple case of self-defense. The Hardin County Circuit Court announced that uh, Shannon was going to be charged with first-degree murder. There were some of the, the family members that, that thought that that was evidence of malice. You can use self-defense for a reasonable amount of defense based on circumstances, but the more you shoot, the less that goes down. So the fact that she shot every round tends to indicate that she intended on doing what happened that day. To the detectives involved in the investigation, the grand jury's decision comes as a surprise. 
I investigated it up until about June 23rd of that year when my son was born, and I went on paternity leave. If I'd been in there, she probably would not have been indicted because I felt strongly that if this isn't self-defense, then self-defense does not exist. This case that everyone thought was over suddenly is going to trial. By that time, Shannon has already returned to Arkansas. She learns about her indictment from the Hardin County Sheriff's Department. We were keeping in contact with her, and then when she was indicted, she voluntarily came back. Shannon posted a uh, $10,000 bond and was then released. If convicted, Shannon could spend the rest of her life in prison. After everything that she's been through, the suffering, the abuse, it could not have been an easy thing for her to take. One minute, she's a free woman. The next minute, she's on trial for murder. Coming up, new evidence turns the case upside down. It was a courtroom bombshell, to say the least. With her abusive husband out of the picture, it seemed Shannon Bogus's troubles were over in July of 2010. But even though investigators cleared her of wrongdoing, a grand jury has decided to charge her with murder four months after his death. The indictment was a little unexpected. Up until this point, everything's been going in Shannon's favor. Police agreed that she was simply defending herself against a man who was abusing her. On January 31st, 2011, the trial gets underway. Shannon was being portrayed as a battered woman who had no choice but to kill her husband. We're in a situation where it's either her life or his. But prosecutors painted a very different picture for the jury. The prosecution also argued that Shannon had shot Eddie multiple times. And this is something was probably the prosecution's best argument because self-defense, you think, okay, you shoot once, you stop him from coming at you. Prosecutors don't question the fact that Shannon suffered years of abuse or that she had reason to be afraid of Eddie. However, they don't believe it was the reason she chose that day to shoot him. The prosecution argued that Shannon had planned Eddie's death and that this was not a case of self-defense. Two people came forward and gave information that she had tried to get them to kill Eddie. The two witnesses, Ashley and Nicholas, are close friends of the Boguses. They'd known Eddie for a long time, and the four of them got together a lot, so they were familiar with the problems in this relationship. They said in 2009, Shannon came to them with a proposition. Ashley and Nicholas testified that uh, Shannon had tried to uh, hire them to do away uh, with her husband. According to the two would-be assassins, Shannon's true motive wasn't self-defense, but revenge. Ashley claimed that Shannon told her she was fed up with the abuse and fed up with being the only breadwinner. She wanted Eddie gone, but she also wanted him to pay a price for everything he'd done to her. Ashley's boyfriend, Nicholas, confirmed her story, and he testified that he had been present when Shannon talked about killing Eddie. Their testimony changes everything. If the allegations are true, it helps prove the shooting wasn't an act of self-defense, but a premeditated murder. It was a courtroom bombshell, to say the least. That was certainly something that I did not know. So it did lend credence to the fact that she could have been guilty of this. Up until that point, the jury was probably in Shannon's corner. It's easy to sympathize with a battered wife, but now she's starting to not look like the victim at all. Ashley and Nicholas both say they turned down Shannon's offer. Prosecutors tell the jury that's when Shannon decided to take matters into her own hands. She was tired of being beaten, and she didn't want to leave it up to the legal system. Instead, what she wanted was revenge. She wanted Eddie dead, and she disguised his murder as self-defense. She basically waited for an opportunity to present itself, and the next time Eddie started to beat her, she used it as an excuse to shoot him. This was about seeking retribution against a man who had caused her tremendous pain. 
Shannon's defense attorneys attempt to minimize the damage by discrediting the state's witnesses. For one thing, they both had criminal records, and it turned out Ashley was currently facing charges of her own. So possibly she just wanted to give prosecutors something that might get her a plea deal. I had a lot of problems with what they were saying. They should have came forward beforehand, and maybe we could have prevented it. There were also inconsistencies in the witnesses' stories. One of them claimed they were offered $5,000 to kill Eddie. The other claimed it was ten. What got me is they were real good friends with Eddie. Someone says, hey, I'll give you $10,000 to kill him, and they don't say a word until he's killed by her. That, to me, was a little suspicious. The money itself is also a question. Shannon was the only one working to support Eddie and her kids. So without some kind of insurance policy, where was the money coming from? I'm not sure how Shannon would have came up with $10,000 to pay these individuals because they they lived a a very humble life. Ashley and Nicholas admit they don't know how Shannon was going to pay them either. Under cross-examination, they both admitted that uh, they weren't really sure if Shannon was serious about that or not. So the defense got them to say that she might have been joking about having Eddie murdered. She was at the end of her rope. She was looking for a way out. That doesn't mean she actually wanted them to do it. But prosecutors argue that it doesn't matter. The fact that Shannon had been thinking about killing Eddie for over a year was enough to show intent. It's definitely enough to put doubt in the jury's mind. And sometimes that's all it takes to get them thinking about the evidence in a different way. The question was, could Shannon's defense attorneys come back with a strong enough argument to keep her from going to prison for the rest of her life? Coming up. The defense produces a surprise witness of its own. She had uh, marks all over her face. She had marks on her back. Shannon Bogus' trial for the murder of her husband, Eddie, is underway in February of 2011. State prosecutors have taken the image of Shannon Bogus as a battered wife and changed her into a vengeful killer who plotted the death of her husband for over a year. It was my understanding that that she did try to hire somebody to take care of Eddie, but they didn't want no part of it. And so maybe she decided she needed to do it herself. She waited until he hit her again and used it as an excuse to shoot him six times with a 357 Magnum at point blank range. But Shannon's attorneys argue that the state hasn't come close to proving its case. The state of Tennessee and in some other states are stand your ground law. And what that law says is that if someone is using deadly force against you, you are not under the duty to retreat or to run away. And in Shannon's case, she couldn't run away because there was a wall behind her. As evidence, Shannon's attorney shows the jury photos taken of her the night of the shooting. She'd gone through lots of abuse. She had blood in her eardrum. She had uh, marks all over her face. She had marks on her back. As to why Shannon allowed the abuse to go on this long before doing something about it, the defense argues it's not that unusual at all. It's a fairly common occurrence in spousal abuse situations. It's called battered women syndrome, and it's a form of PTSD, which causes abused women to return to their abusers time and time again. Lynn Zager, a psychologist and director of a women's shelter, testified that Shannon suffered from this syndrome. The defense also calls a surprise witness to the stand, the agent from the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations who worked the case, Terry Dykus. I'll never forget when I found out Ms. Bogus had got indicted and I called my boss, uh, John Mayer. The TBI always supported me, didn't always agree with me, but they always supported me. I told them, um, I believe this is self-defense, but obviously the prosecution does. How should I handle this? And they said, we've got your back. You, you do what you want to do to clear your conscience, and we've got your back. On the 911 call, Shannon is over there. She's distraught. She's telling, she's telling Central Dispatch exactly what happened. She's telling them where the gun is. They asked him if the evidence that he found in the investigation was consistent with Shannon's claim of self-defense. He said yes. The slightest thing could could set Eddie off. He would assault her over trivial 
very minor issues um, because he was so controlling. She was in a small room, trapped in a corner, getting beat with a whip. She had a 357 Magnum handy, and that was all she had. That was her only chance. He also explains why he believes Shannon kept pulling the trigger until she ran out of bullets. She continued to fire out of, out of fear. I have no doubt. Uh, and, and that was confirmed with everyone in the house. Everyone told me individually, separately, in private. He was beating her with something. She just wasn't going to take it any longer. She started getting beat, so she started shooting. There had just been a long pattern of abuse. It wasn't like it was a one-time thing, and all of a sudden she snapped. The prosecution agrees this hadn't been a crime of passion. During closing arguments, they remind the jury that Shannon had been thinking about killing her husband since 2009. She talked about doing it and possibly even tried to hire someone else to do it for her. Instead of leaving Eddie and reporting the abuse, she'd acted as a vigilante and taken matters into her own hands. The assistant district attorney stood in front of the jury holding the revolver that was used in the killing and pulled the trigger six times to show just how deliberate the action is and how long it would take to fire six shots. The defense closes by playing the 911 call from Shannon just moments after she shot Eddie. They wanted the jury to hear how upset she was, how sad she was about what she'd had to do, even though he'd hit her so hard she could barely think straight. Shannon, are you still there? I'm going, I, I, wait a minute, I can't, you let me swap, swap ears, I can't hear, he slapped me in the side of the head. Okay, God, I love him. All right, let me tell you. But I couldn't be thinking he's more. I couldn't take it. When the jury got the case, I felt the proof was fairly indicative of self-defense, but I've been through enough to see every which way on that scenario, so I had no idea what, what they would decide. After deliberating for a little over an hour, the jury returned with their decision. In February of 2011, the jury came back with the not guilty verdict. I was relieved that she wasn't going to spend the rest of her life in prison. I wouldn't ever say I was happy. I mean, uh, you know, one of God's children lost his life, and that's, that's very sad. It's extremely sad. But I was relieved that she didn't, she didn't get punished for it. Eddie Bogus' friends and family may not have agreed, but in the end, justice had been served. Not only for Shannon, but for the wrongs her husband had inflicted on her and their children. Of course, Shannon was was extremely emotional. Uh, there were some folks in the in the audience that were very emotional as well. As she was leaving, I, I did ask her, you know, how she felt, and she said, uh, "I'm free. I won't have to be beaten anymore." Eddie said something interesting to Shannon once. He he said, "You know, I learned early that I could control people with violence, and you know, does that mean control their love, control how they feel about him, control the fact that they can't abandon him?" I mean, she, he always said he would track her down. Abusive men often do that, but we don't turn around and we don't stop and think about why are they abusing and why they may need treatment too. I think Shannon's story, I guess if there's any lesson to be learned from it, it would be that it isn't just battered women who need help. It's, it's those men who abuse them, and I think we need to address that as a society. Thank you. 